tonight on Joy News Prime, 31 suspects, including one female, detained at the BNI for their role in disturbances in the Volta region, which saw some major roads leading in and out of the region blocked for hours. Security has since been heightened in the region with the police and military still on the hand for other accomplices. We have uh, reporters embedded with the counter-terrorism unit of the Ghana Police Service currently securing the area. Meanwhile, the Ghana Police Service says there was an attempt to seize the bone hydro plant. A group of people who had besieged the dam and they were saying that the dam belonged to them, so they are taking over. Also in this bulletin, a Sin Central MP Kennedy Japan pleads not guilty to contempt charges as a video of him describing a judge as stupid, foolish and an animal is played to him in court. We've made our position clear in open court. We have uh, also made clear to the court that we have invoked the supervisory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in this matter. Business. Turning local farmers into investors under the 1D1 air project. We hear from Trade Minister Alan Tremantin as he inspects 6.6 .6 million city rice processing factory in the Western North region. Empowering farmers who otherwise would have absolutely no opportunity to be able to raise funding from a bank to establish a processing facility. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Joy News Prime comes to you live from our studios in Kokum Limle on your digital terrestrial TV because we're free to air on Go TV channel 144 and DSTV channel 421. Many thanks for choosing us. 31 suspects are this evening in the custody of the Bureau of National Investigations after they were rounded up in the Volta region and airlifted to Accra. The suspects are being detained in connection with the blockade of roads leading in and out of the region, which left many commuters stranded in their vehicles for several hours Friday dawn after they used heaps of sand to block the Mepet-Seget Road and the Akraho Road at Joapon, preventing the flow of traffic. <laughs> The suspects are believed to belong to Homeland Study Group, which has been seeking for a while now to secede from Ghana. Some armed men believed to be members of the group, which is also known as the Western Togoland Secessionist Group, reportedly attacked Aveime and Mepe police stations in the Notong district of the Volta region in early hours of Friday and forcibly took over both stations simultaneously, overpowered the police officers, broke into the armory and made away with all the weapons. Joy News' Max Alagbaba is embedded with the counter-terrorism unit of the Ghana Police Service, which is currently carrying out an operation in the Volta region, and he will be joining us shortly with what he's been able to gather so far. But let's first hear from Kwesi Paka Wilson, who was at the Air Force Base at Bema Camp, where the suspects were first airlifted from the Volta region. We are here at the Ghana Air Force Base. I mean, clearly, here is the tarmac, and just behind me, as the aircraft or the helicopter or the helo, as you want to put it, that brought in the 
31 suspected members of the Homeland Steady Foundation, or uh, those we call the Western Togoland, those who are seeking independence for the Volta region. Now, these individuals were brought in in two badges. First of all, 16 of them were brought in earlier, and the remainder, that's 15 of them, were later brought in now. The protocols were, 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 were quite simple. Okay, so as you can see, they are just descending one after the other, one by one. They are, yeah, the, the military men are escorting them as they descend one after the other, one by one. So these are the men. These are the men who are allegedly behind the Western Togoland. And the police just brought them here. And as you can see, uh, they've asked them to sit down right on the platform where the uh, oh i've seen a female um i've seen just one lady here she doesn't look too good uh, she's crying she looks very sad um in the yellow yellow top she looks very very sad when they were brought in the military men put together with the uh, ghana police service especially the cid uh, took them through the process in fact they asked them to sit down on the platform here right here and they ask for their details and also search their bags interestingly uh, some of the people uh, who were brought in were holding the new voters id card but they had in possession the new voters id card some of them also have the uh, western togoland flag and the police asked them to even wave it to the 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 media also, we noticed that among the 31 men who were arrested, one female was part of the group. So there are 30, 31, one female and 30 men. And with the strict supervision of the Ghana Armed Forces and the Ghana Police Service. So they spent just about 10 minutes here going through the process. And right from the process, they conveyed them to the the police truck and the, uh, the, the the military truck and we are told that they are moving them to the BNI head office where they are going to interrogate them. We also have AC Region correspondent Kofi Sian, who has also been following the story from Japan. Kofi will be joining us shortly for this, but he's also been reporting about the disturbances this morning in that area. Listen. And I saw uh, uh, soldiers arrest them. They are three. In one of my sister's son too. They are just uh, watching TV in the room before the cargo. So we plead, we plead, but uh, they refuse. So they send them to uh, home. The soldiers. They are in one of uh, my, my sister's room here. So they go there and uh, they are, you know, I don't know what they do. They didn't tell us anything. They are just sucking at the police uh, soldiers. They are just sucking us. And I asked one of them, uh, if you look at me or only, I'm not doing anything to catch my son. So I, I begged. They said, oh, I should enter the room. I should enter the room. And I begged. In their car. That Gunja car, like this one. Um, Joining me via Zoom for more is Professor Kwesi Enin, who is a security analyst. Um, doc, uh, Prof, I'm grateful for your time. Now, many describe this incident as a failed state intelligence. How would you describe this incident? One looks at the professionalism, the coordination, the speed, and the time that 
these secessionists took to deliver speeches, to wave the flag, to mobilize people, to whip up sentiments, then it raises very fundamental questions as to how they managed to come so deep into the country and to undertake these operations. So there yeah, are some really very tough you know, questions that we need to answer. But even more worryingly is that there's a press release that I've just seen coming from the police service, um, admonishing people to provide information. But there's no dedicated line uh, for people to do so. So I would appeal to the Ghana Police Service uh, to withdraw that statement and to issue a new one with a dedicated line so that people can call in if they have information. But this raises some really very fundamental challenges. This will not be the last time that we hear from this particular group. We need to be careful about knee-jerk reactions. Um, I would suggest also that when people are arrested, they are not put on television. I mean, uh, because the manner in which such individuals are dealt with and handled um, can actually generate some sympathy for wherever they are coming from and whoever they are trying to send some, some signals to. We should not be too complacent in the manner in which we deal with these people. History tells us that in Liberia, in Sierra Leone, in Mali, in, in Burkina Faso, all it took was just a very tiny spark. If we look at the history of insurgencies in West Africa, this is the most, this is the single most successful first attack on a sovereign state. We have, we, we have a lot of questions to answer and certainly the Parliamentary Committee on Defense and Interior must be calling some people to appear before it. I think His Excellency, the President, must also be calling some people to provide him with some very serious explanations. This is not acceptable at all, but that's totally unacceptable. Well, I think more worrying is the fact that in this case, we're told the secessionist group reportedly attacked um, two police stations, forcibly took yes. over overpowered the police officers, broke into the armory, and made mm -hmm. away with all the weapons. This is scary. 10 AK, AK-47s. Now, it is the symbolism that matters. The, the guns themselves that they managed to take is very symbolic because these guns are available, explosives are available in Ghana, electronic detonators are easily available in Ghana. It is the symbolism of the attack that they managed to attack an institution that represents the efficacy of the state and the state's representatives were not able to stand and defend their identity and their respect. You know, so it is a signal that the sense that if we can attack two stations and demobilize them, break into the um, armory. And, and let me be also be quite frank here. Quite a number of these armories are very poor built. You know, so it, it doesn't take much to be able to break into it. But it is the symbolism. If you can attack a place, a uniformed encouragement to others, that the struggle that we are fighting for may not be as unachievable or as unattainable as we had thought. So this poses some really very tough challenges. But hold on a minute for me. Let me bring in our Eastern Region correspondent, Kofi Sian, who has also been following this issue from Japan. Kofi, uh, good to have you. What can you report from where you are? Okay, so Aisha, in the morning, I go wind of what was happening that some uh, persons have blocked the main Japan road and they were burning ties here and there. So we got to the place and when I got there, I realized that the police officers and the military have been able to arrest some people and they have cleared the road as well. So uh, these people, we are told, have been airlifted from uh, Japan to Accra 
Kamara at the military base. So that is the information we got in the morning and a few that we also observed uh, here in Japan. And as I speak with you, the camp has returned to the place, even though the military and the police are here in their numbers. They search every vehicle that passes through the main streets uh, from the water region or uh, from the eastern region heading towards the opposite direction. So uh, it, it's been a very tough day for the security officers and for the residents here as well. Let's now go to Maxwell Agbaba, who is embedded with the counterterrorism unit of the Ghana Police Service. Agbaba, where have you been and which part of the region are you now? Um, I shall be going to uh, different parts um, of the local region. Um, the first um, part of the tour was in the first, you know, which is also here in the local region. We also went to um, Abdaina, where two police stations were actually um, attacked, came under attack. Um, where I am right now, very close to the Sugar Cooper Street, you can see some activity going on um, in the background. We understand that part of this bridge was also blocked. But we've been with the uh, security personnel, combined team of soldiers. Uh, we also had um, the Navy, we had uh, some intelligence officers also, and then personnel of the counter terrorism. And uh, we finished a different community, and the police officers were actually before they were deployed, we were told that it was a high risk emergency operation to actually receive some weapons um, that were stolen as a very much mistaken, and then um, some people also that were taken away um, at that place. So we went to um, Abdelina, we went to the third, we went to Adidome, and then went to a community court in Akito. And in that community, um, that was the first place where we had to see the personnel, you know, entering the room to actually conduct the uh, to look for um, the weapons that were stolen from the Adaima um, police station. We were also at the Bato um, Hospital, there at the Bato Hospital. We saw the strong divisional commander and his driver who were told were attacked, um, you know, um, at the Adaima police station. And they were being airlifted to the police hospital for them to receive treatment. Uh, as the fact found just a minute ago, we arrived here in Sudan and the team has actually had us go to the Sudan police station where a new is currently on board. However, hold on there for me. Let me bring in Professor Enin. Uh, Prof, what's the reality going forward, considering the fact that election is just around the corner? Well, I mean, I think this ties into quite a number of yeah, developments number of that have taken place the last three to four months or so. First, we saw the public excitement and respect for the security uh -huh. forces uh -huh. they came to do the uh, COVID work. Then we saw a shift in the manner in which the public related to the security forces during the um, election, uh, the voter re registration, anger, abuse, stoning, threats, confrontations, fights. Then we saw the rather disturbing development a couple of weeks ago where soldiers were captured in this town in a Wutu thereabouts, where they had been used for service. That is not the military's role, dealing in land. So over the last couple of months, we are seeing the aura and invincibility around the armed forces itself beginning to go away. Now people are not afraid. Then we see this major hiccup in our intelligence you know, setup. Okay, so going forward, those who do what is happening, do we need to change the, the, uh, the doctrine? Are we having a, a domestic extremist terrorist group in which we need different forms of response mechanisms? Because it's quite obvious, based on what has happened the last couple of months, that we need to change change the strategy, that we need better intelligence, we need more forward-looking analysis and approaches to how we understand what may seemingly on surface look like a very simple problem 
And then we need to learn to carry the public along. Okay, we are being told to provide information, but where do we provide it to? Who do we provide it? How do we do it? Okay, so we need to be able to say what are the threats that are beginning violence that we have seen in the uh, Ayawaso by election. When we put all these things into the mix, uh, then we need to do a little bit of hard work. I'm grateful for your time. Okay. Professor Kwesi Enin, a security analyst, and he's been talking about how oh, we should face the reality and back up security. Let's go back to the eastern region where Kofi Sian is stationed. Kofi, how are the residents reacting to all of this? Well, there is anxiety and fear among uh, some of these residents. According to a few I spoke with, what they say is, is that uh, these security men, uh, when arresting some of these suspects, uh, arrested the wrong people. So they describe the arrest as very unlawful, and that even though they support the work of the security officers in that area, they want them to be very professional in their dealings with the residents. And let's listen to what the resident told me. From 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. and then we were just hearing a lot of noise outside. Uh, then it was obviously and we need to come out and what we could, we could witness was that it was just a bonfire that was tied burning on the road and we couldn't get closer to them. Uh, so we are just around our houses. Our houses were just near the roadside, and then uh, we could see the military men pursuing the tourists, and then there was a gunshot, and all, all over was happening. But I couldn't tell exactly what bring the show, what end the show, and what goes on over there. But what I witnessed was that there was a gunshot, there was people bouncing on the people over there, and that was what I seen. And you know, I was also afraid and I have to leave the scene and I have to just run into my room. So that was how I witnessed this very morning. The only thing that has great fear in me was that the military men ran into our homes. Uh, they were chasing some people around, they passed around our houses and then the military men rushed into our homes were just shooting up guns, which can also uh, kill somebody at that moment. So we're all afraid and it was very dangerous that we were living close to the, the, the scene where the thing has happened. Uh, so that has brought fear into me that uh, as they are they are still around our areas and they were arresting people, that uh, innocent people, they were arresting them and I don't understand and that, that, that was what was happening. So it gave a lot of fear in us and that uh, we don't know what will happen if we are in our house again. They will just come and bounce on us, begin to arrest us. We don't know. There's a lot of gunshots. They were even pointing the guns on us. And even I was uh, at the corridor of my house, uh, there were guns on me, and I, they told me to go inside my room. And I have to go inside the room with my wife and my kids. Uh, so that was happening. Uh, but later on, they came to open the, the way. Alter region Maxwell Agbagba is with the counter terrorism unit. Maxwell, what is the security presence in the areas you visited? Hello, Maxwell. I think we're losing Maxwell. They will try and get him back on the line to tell us whether there's been further arrest and how the security presence over there looks like but joy news is learning there was an attempt to take over the more hydro generating plant during the disturbances this morning the police commander for Akusi, chief superintendent asari nyako has been speaking about the attempt yes today around uh, three o'clock we gathered intelligence that uh, there were a group of people who had besieged the dam and they were saying that the dam belong to them, so they are taking over. We didn't know the kind of people who were there, so immediately police, we proceed to the place. 
we met about six of them initially. When they were questioned, we were told that they are from Western Togoland and that this place where the dam is belongs to them. And for that matter, they are taking over from Ghana government. In fact, looking at them, we saw that uh, they were very aggressive and uh, they are likely to be armed. So police were able to uh, talk to them, speak to them, and then drove them out of the dam. As we are going, we were going to the other side of the dam, we met another group of them, more than 20, so 20 plus 6 is about 26 to 30. We saw that they had blocked the way at the other side from the voter region, that is from Japan. And they, we saw also they had blocked the road with, and then set uh, fire into a tie. And then there were some buses, uh, workers' buses around that they said they would not allow them to cross the dam. In fact, uh, it was a very critical situation. We called for reinforcement, and even before the reinforcement arrived, we were able to uh, uh, drive them out and then uh, quench the fire. So far now, the situation is very calm. We have so many uh, of uh, reinforcement, the military and the, and the police from the headquarters and the region, and uh, now we are doing patrols. The situation is calm. Any arrests? So far, no arrest has, was made in the morning. Uh, we, are just, we just saw somebody with a motorbike and then they're carrying the uh, uh, flag of the Western Togoland. He's been arrested and uh, he's been questioned. There was no attack. As initially, when they were entering, I was, we were told uh, they, they um, took a, a mobile phone from one of the private security officers who was at the gate. We were able to retrieve the, uh, the said uh, uh, phone and then the, giving back to him. What was the gentleman who was arrested was on the dam. He was on the dam. He was not out of the dam. The dam we have, the east. There's been a number of statements uh, released in the last few minutes. Uh, one from the Defense Ministry, and I'll take excerpts of the statement uh, on your screen shortly. It reads, and this is from the Council of State. It said, the Council of State's attention has been drawn to the seizure of police equipment from their armory, collecting their arms and ammunition and the blockage of some roads by miscreants seeking to create confusion among the citizenry. The council considers this as unfortunate since such activities constitute risk for civil unrest. More than ever before, Ghana needs peace at the time like this when the nation is preparing for elections, fighting the COVID-19 pandemic with its antecedents of economic meltdown. The council calls on the security agencies to be vigilant and swift in dealing with the matter on hand. They should also keep a watchful eye through intelligence gathering and deal decisively with persons involved in such unconscionable activities. And it is signed by the Secretary of the Council of State, William Carty. There are some more statements coming up, one from the Defence Ministry, one from the police. We'll share it uh, later in this bulletin. But still to come, as in Central MP, Kennedy Japan pleads not guilty to contempt charges as a video of him describing a judge as stupid, foolish and an animal is played to him in court. We made our position clear in open court. We have uh, also made clear to the courts that we have invoked the supervisory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in this matter. There is more when we return from the break. Hi there, time for business. I'm Charles Aite. The Minister for Trade and Industry, Alan Tremantin, has embarked on phase two of his tour at various project sites under the One District, One Factory initiative. The latest visit was to a rice processing factory in the northern south uh, region, that's the north, the west north region, I should rather say, where he inspected various factories and impressed on various farmers there to adapt new technologies to remain competitive in the global market. There is more in this report. 
The rice processing factory at Bokasu Sushi Akontumbra district in the western north region falls under the second model of the 1D1 program which identifies groups of farmers who lack the capacity to establish processing facilities for their produce. Trade Minister Alan Tremantin explained the injection of the seed capital will boost productivity. So what government is doing is empowering farmers who otherwise would have absolutely no opportunity to be able to raise funding from a bank to establish a processing facility. So government provides the, 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 uh, the capital, the seed capital, for them to install such a processing. And because it is owned by the farmers, it means that they get maximum value from not just supplying, uh, in this case, paddy rice to their own processing mill, but when it is milled, which is where the value really is, they also then get the full uh, value in terms of dividends. The factory is 65% complete and expected to be finalized by the end of the year. Its production capacity is expected to be at one and a half tons of rice per hour. Kusiata Injury is the national director for the Rural Enterprise Program. So already uh, we have exceeded our target, but we are still moving forward with these new ideas from the current the government that is bringing up such infrastructure that was originally not part of our program uh, design. The 1D1F Common User Processing Facility is an agro-processing facility made up of building equipped with machines to process raw materials or convert agro-industrial materials into products. The costs are being established by the Rural Enterprises Program of the Ministry of Trade and Industry in line with the Government of Ghana's flagship One District One Factory Policy. They are being established with funding from the African Development Bank under the Agricultural Commodity Processing Infrastructure Development of the Rural Enterprise Program. Now, economist Professor Peter Korte is projecting some significant increase in cocoa production following plant jump in producer prices. Now, this comes after President Akufuado announced a 28% hike for one bag of cocoa beans, which is approximately 660 Ghana CDs. Professor Peter Korte tells Joy Business the move will have an impact on the city in a positive way. Yeah, the increment, which is about 28.4%, is a laudable idea in the sense that it will motivate farmers to produce more of their crop. It will motivate them to invest uh, part of the proceeds in their farms. It will encourage them to not to cut down cocoa trees, but also rather groom their trees so that we could get better yield or output. And then it will also discourage them from smuggling. So when you put all of this together, you will realize that output is very likely likely to increase. Granted that nothing uh, untoward happens, then we are likely to see higher yields in, in cocoa, and that will translate into higher income. So if you compute our production or GDP, you will find that cocoa would grow, uh, the share of cocoa, the output of cocoa would grow. Now, the chief executive of Bayport Savings and Loans, Nii Amankra Teta, is making a strong case for businesses and entrepreneurs to consider raising funds from the Ghana Stock Exchange through bonds in supporting the operations for growth. According to him, there are cheaper sources of raising funds from the bears as compared to borrowing. He was speaking to Joy Business after the company presented its financial report to shareholders, which indicates an impressive half-year result despite COVID-19. So much opportunity. I think um, increasingly, um, Ghanaians need to look more at that part. If we are looking to build the economy that we want and want to be proud of, um, we, we need to begin to start to look at that alternative stock exchange and say, are there companies there who we can also invest in and get? And, and the, the returns on that market is also fantastic. So um, we, we've had a great um, partnership with the Ghana Stock Exchange. Um, and, and, and a great run with them um, with our medium term, term notes um, over the last five years or so. Um, and I encourage other um, companies who are looking to raise capital, looking to raise equity, to definitely have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. hey, yeah, we, we, we are actually in the market right now. Um, we've, we are issuing 
um, um, a bond, um, and we are, we are looking to raise some capital. So it's, it's one of our sources of income. It's not something we're going to get off the market now. Um, and we constantly would be raising it as and when we need to um, and applying it to our business. Mm. Is that a cheaper source? Um, yes. The, the, it, 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 well, there are different terms in the market, but for now it's one of the reasonable sources compared to the other sources we've got available, yes. Numbers to run you by Bayport recorded a 3% growth in total assets to 809 million cities compared to 788 million cities in 2019. That's how we wrap up business for this edition. Sport is up next with Gary Elsman. So COVID has come. COVID is not entirely gone, but life is returning to normal. And nothing um, gives that indication more than when a Black Star squad is mentioned. CK Akono has named his first squad that hopefully will be playing this time. And they'll be playing next month in an international friendly against Mali. Five debutants were included in the call-ups, which will see the team play in Antalya, that is in Turkey. Full list of the players presented by the coach. Let's look at it now here on the Pulse uh, on Joy News Prime. Let's take a look at it. Players for the upcoming match in October. The names are Richard Ofori, Maris Bok, Lawrence Atizigi, Sangalian, Bazak Abalora, clubless now, but very soon will be with the club. At the fullbacks are Benson Annan, Zelina FC, Lumo Agbenyenu, Sporting Club, Yakubu Mohamed Azam, Gideon Mensa, Victoria Gomez, Centre backs, Alessandra Jiku, Strasbourg, Joseph Edu, Celta Vigo. Nicolas Opoku, Amiens, Kasim Nuhu, Hoffenheim. The midfielders are Thomas Partey, Atletico Madrid, Emmanuel Lomote, Amiens, Bernard Mensa, Bexitas, Baba Idrisu, Mallorca, and attackers comprises of uh, our captain Andrew Ayu, Swansea, John Ayu, Crystal Palace, <laughs> John Entry, Pyramids FC. Eugene Ansa, Hapoel Shmona, Jeffrey Schlopp, Crystal Palace, Samuel Wusu, Alpha Yar FC, Kamal Dean, Norgeland, and Mohamed Kudus, Ayas. You notice that when he mentioned Crystal Palace this time, he smiled. Yeah, if you know, you know. Anyway, still on the squad, Akuna has been explaining his choice of players invited to make their debut. Yakubu uh, is a, a new guy, uh, known in this country, he's played very well uh, through the ranks of Adriana and now in, 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 in Azam he's doing well, he's the captain of the team. His situation is exceptional because he could play a lot of different positions, uh, holding midfield and of course right back, but his main position is the centre back. I'm, I'm personally excited about, about him because uh, Chiku um, at a point in time we were not sure if he, he really wants to come, he didn't have a problem of uh, switching nationality, but a decision to come uh, to play. And now he's decided to, to come, and so I'm, I'm very much excited about him. Yeah. He's not only a centre-back, but he, he's also as well can play uh, a holding, depending on what, what area you want to, you want to go. Uh, in terms of when you go on away matches, if you want to be more defensive, it's a choice. You know? and, but he brings a lot of uh, experience. Um, I saw him in Strasbourg when I went to Europe to watch them and uh, he was it was really good market. Lomote uh, a boy I know uh, from uh, child and I'm happy uh, with his progress um, um, when he played with the uh, under 23s he did very very well I think he deserves a chance he's, he's, he's done well he's moved from Spain now to uh, France and uh, I think his second match or first match he was one of a man of the match uh, he's done well uh, for himself, he's improved, and I think he deserves a, a chance. Uh, he's a very uh, good player, young, he needs patience, he needs time, but I think we need to start developing. If we're looking up at the next four or five years, these are the guys we, we will learn. Once we, we are able to start with people like that, motivating them slowly in a, in, a, in a way. We are not going to push them too much, but we want to slowly develop them, get them into, into the team. Uh, he reminds me of uh, Jeremy Doku, 
unfortunately, he's, he's, he's gone for uh, Belgium. Uh, so uh, he, he has that kind of uh, style, uh, ability to play like him. And, and I think it's necessary to bring him again uh, to have a look at him, be around the team and see the likes of Didier Ayou and, and the captain and Jordan and others if to, they could help him to you know, be a better, a better player in the national team. I like players who, at a point in time, can bring confusion into the opponents, uh, constant disturbing, you know, in terms of trouble, making trouble, trying to create chances to score goals. And he's one of the guys who, who does that. He takes one-on-one -on -one situation, he's, he's good at that, he, he plays, he attacks, and he likes to score, you know. And, and so we're looking forward to get players like that who will be constant in, in that sense. We don't look for players who, uh, after five minutes action, 20 minutes before, uh, they get another chance to do. We want a constant situation. And so uh, we give him uh, Eugene Ansa a chance. Don't forget we have two matches and all these players will definitely have a chance to showcase their, their talent and to prove to us that they are, they are equally good. John Entry, I on earth, me and Odati on earth him in, in 11 wise. Um, since then, he's, he's done well for himself. The last time we, uh, we had a collapse, he, he was not part of the team because I was then personally not too convinced that uh, he should be part of the team at that time because, you know, I'm looking at consistency with the team. And now I think he's proven beyond doubt that he's, he's equally good. He scored 100 goals, uh, now I think 102. And I think he deserves a chance um, because he's, he's, he's done well. Egypt, Egyptian lake is it's not an easy lake. It's not a lake that you can just look at and throw, throw out, and he's done well. So John Entry indeed has scored 102 goals and he's the only or the first and only foreign base player in Egypt to have scored 100, and, or 100 goals and more in Egypt. That's why Siki Akono is saying that it's not easy to do that. Anyway, that's the squad and the debate is continuing. You can head over to our Facebook pages. A lot of you are having your say on whether this player or that player should be there or not. But I'm particularly excited that finally we have a Black Stars coach who does not just give us call-ups but explains why this player has been called and this player has not been called. It's the way forward. Gary Alsmith here with this point. And it's time now for Showbiz and We Are Joy. We're 25 years, We're right? We're 25 years. Oh, Aisha, I think among all um, <laughs> our colleagues, we are the ones looking nice. Dapper. Yes. Oh, my God. But it's, it's quite unfortunate <laughs> that we don't have our pictures there. But here are, you know, some, you know, multimedia, you know, they, they, are, they have fashion sense. So we most can of them. I'm telling you. Shall look they? at that. <laughs> See, so that, look at Fire Lady, right? Yeah. There. Cardi. My goodness. Beautiful, beautiful outfit. Beautiful outfit. Beautiful cloth. Oh, my goodness. Multimedia all the way. 25 years. But ours is right here. You I'm super excited. excited. Yeah. 25 years of excellence. Mm -hmm. 25 years of um, fearless journalism. journalism. 25 years of everything mm. best when mm. it comes to media. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Congratulations I, I, to I us. I am, you know, privileged to be yeah. part of this group. And I'm sure you are too, I Vicky. Am, I am, Aisha. I oh, am. What do you goodness. make of my... Congratulations. My beautiful... Your beautiful outfit. I don't know why they didn't take a picture of me. I have to go and tell Katie. But, but we took a picture together. Together, but what happened? Don't worry, it will be, be crying getting... on social media very soon. Instagram, so, Facebook, so, watch so for out. Those of us, for those of you who would like to uh, see myself and Aisha in action, go on myjawonline.com. That's where you find all the pictures. All the pictures from, will be there. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, Aisha, uh, the Australian High Commish Commissioner. Commissioner, yes. Yeah, you know he's new. Yeah. And he's been uh, speaking to us. Uh, and he says that he is very much in love with Wiala. Okay. And Osibisa. Mm -hmm. You know, for somebody like that to... To be in love with, I um, mean, people who are going you no know, really local yeah there must be something special yeah so he's been speaking to uh, a colleague on the business desk um and we have this for you i think my favorite is probably weala i really enjoy weala uh but at the moment I, I have to confess my favorite song not just in africa but my favorite song at the moment is jerusalem 
which I believe is from Needed the South African band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but, but um, yeah, I really like Wiala, and I also enjoy. Is it Odessa? Ode oh, it's like a 1970s. Osibisa. Osibisa, yeah. Osibisa. Osibisa. I'll okay. say that again. The, the <laughs> other artist I like, I'm probably, I'm 52, so I'm probably a bit old fashioned, <laughs> but I really like Osibisa. Okay. Uh, it, actually, he reminds me a bit of Boney M and ABBA. It's that real 1970s it's music. So, so. I love it. Celebrating 25 years of media excellence. So our business community in Ghana and abroad, yet don't want us. Barka. Mm. <laughs> Feel the spirit like we do it in India. I'm <laughs> and that will be it for showbiz. Thank you so much for bringing us showbiz. Anytime. Welcome back to Journey's Prime to the rest of our stories. Assistant Central MP Kennedy Japan has pleaded not guilty to the charge of contempt of court leveled against him. This was after a video recording of him criticizing a high court judge uh, was played in court. The MP in that video is heard describing a judge as stupid, foolish and an animal. His lawyers had attempted to halt proceedings as they informed the judge they had raised issues of fairness of the court proceedings with the Chief Justice. Court correspondent Joseph Akable, however, reports they were unsuccessful as the case progressed. The MP has petitioned the Chief Justice on the matter and also filed an application at the High Court seeking to restrain the judge from proceeding. His lawyers explained Justice Wooney took a position on the matter when he last appeared before him on September 18. They informed the court of this petition, but Justice Wooney opted to proceed with the case. The charge of contempt of court was read against the MP who pleaded not guilty. The court then played a video recording in which the MP used words like stupid and foolish against the judge. The there was deafening silence at the High Court as the recording played for well over five minutes. The MP's lawyers then requested an adjournment to respond to the case against him. A member of the legal team at Fenya Market has been speaking to pressmen. We've made our position clear in open court. We have uh, also made clear to the court that we have invoked the supervisory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court in this matter. We've also drawn the court's own attention to a motion we have filed before it, which motion is for stay of proceedings. And the registrar of the same court has given us a 12 October as a return date. All these we disclosed to the court and the court considered having notice of same. So that is where we stand. The Supreme Court made a clear position on the law, disclosure, and Article 19, that in such trials, there must be the evidence to be relied upon by the prosecution made available to the accused. So the defendant can, uh, the, the, the defense can prepare adequately. So I am, satisfied with the engagement so far. Fortunately, there is mutual respect between the bar and the bench. It is not a banter. And you never know. Some of these cases, at the end of the day, you may get emotional about it, but no, we are not emotional about it. We are looking for resolving the vex matters. The case has been adjourned to Monday, September 28th for continuation. Member of Parliament for Ashaman Constituency, NS Nogwe, says it's impossible for the NPP parliamentary candidate Alahaji Yakubu Labaran to unseat him in the upcoming December polls. He argues that though Alhaji Labaran is with the governing party, he's failed to push for the construction of the poor roads network within the constituency. This will be the second time the two are contesting each other for that seat. In 2016, Alhaji Labaran garnered 40 percent of the votes cast whilst MP Enes Nogbe secured 58%. The MP says, judging from their performance in the last elections, his contender is no match for him. Uh, even the 
PNC, CPP, eh, 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 all other unknown political parties who always tell you that we are winning hands down. They are winning hands down. You understand? Mm. When, you are, when you come into close contact with a PNC presidential candidate, he will tell you he's winning this national election. The a PNC will take it. No political party, neither an individual who put up himself for an election, who engage in media and tell them, or even the populists, and tell them that uh, he cannot win or he's not winning. So it's a rhetoric. It's just, he's also just saying something. 2016, he did worse than this. 2016 was when I, I unseated uh, Honorable Afred Agbese. Like yeah. So there was there were so were many. Candidates. I was a new candidate, right. and so many. I mean, allegations. I'm not a born in Ashama. He is an Ashama boy. He is born here. He was born here. Blah blah blah. And where did he land him? So today, if he makes those statements once again. <laughs> you just you just disregard them. I will just disregard so them. So they should ignore Labaran, is that what you said? Labaran is is is, is, a is la, 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 Labaran is not a I am not sure even he can win assembly election. Labaran cannot win an no, assembly no, no, election. No, he cannot even win an assembly and election. And man who has won the parliamentary candidate uh, uh, the, the, the parliamentary they are, they are party, of the governing MP. Their party have regretted. His party. His party in Ashiyama says they have regretted voting for him as a candidate. They have regretted so badly, but there's nothing they could do at this point in time. So they just have to allow him to, to, to go like that. What has Labaran, uh, after 2016 election, mm. Labaran was, or let me say, is the only uh, parliamentary candidate who lost power in greater Accra that the MPP did not even consider giving any position. The government did not even consider giving any position. Your government is in power. What did you do for the people of Ashama? 2016, 2014, 2015, when NDC was in power, I was not holding any government position. But that was when I created so many jobs for the youth of Ashama. I made sure we fixed them in government sector, not more and so and so forth, a lot of them. Over 50 of them. And that was why they brought me. These people, the youth of Ashama, brought me to become their leader. And even in opposition, as opposition MP, I'm still fixing people, creating opportunities for them. I mean, in opposition, you, your government is in power. You were able to garner over 34, 35,000 votes for the MPP. So they could have considered him, giving him something. But they are not seeing that kind of leadership quality or somebody who will bring anything new into the system. Mm -hmm. They left him. All other candidates who lost election in Greater Accra, all of them, they were appointed. All of them? All of them, you can cross-check. All of them were given something, appointment. But, except Labaran, in Ashaman. Mm -hmm. So you can understand. That's why the people are all, already disappointed in him. If he were to be able to create some job opportunities for even his own people, then, he would have been doing something at this point in time. But would he also say his government is not in power? His government is in power. <laughs> so what have you done for the people of Shaman? Mr. Nogbe is confident he could actually win by a wider margin this December. Uh, this, this election, we are targeting about 75% of the total vote cast. Mm. And uh, if we have 167,000, barring any last minute a uh, Machiavellian tactics by the Electoral Commission, we still have our 167,000 people on the register. We can have a voter turnout of over, normally a Shama voter turnout is always 80%. Mm. 80%. So we can have about uh, a voter turnout of maybe uh, 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 130 or 140,000 uh, uh, voter turnout. So out of this, why not? We can hit over. Uh, 92 between 85 to 100,000 votes in Ashaman. Because I'm saying that with the sense that if you look at uh, the period of registration and the period of voting, the enthusiasm that led to the registration would, would, wouldn't uh, die before the, uh, uh, the voting. People will still be energized to come and vote because they were energized within four months, then we are going for voting. So we can get a, a very huge voter turnout this time and when we do that we'll be able to uh, 
uh, Ghana almost between 75 80,000. Some say four Member of Parliament for Dom Kwabenya constituent Sarah Juasafo is vowing to localize the promises made by the NPP and its 2020 manifesto within her constituency. The legislator who also doubles as Minister of State in charge of procurement has been assuring her constituents of her commitment to implement far-reaching policies to bolster development in the constituency in the area of infrastructure and human capital. Speaking at an event to launch her 2020 manifesto, Adwa Safo stressed that the next four years under her leadership will see an extension of President Ekofuadu's vision of expanding access to education and empowering women. Kukudu, that is our first victory. That tells you that we need to go out in our numbers and vote for Nana Adodankwa Ekufuado and for Adua Safo to continue the good works that we've done for the people of Domekwa Abenya and the people of Ghana. Kukudu, we have done a lot when it comes to roads. We have done a lot when it comes to education. We have done a lot when it comes to market infrastructure. We have come, we've done a lot when it comes to health and name it, sports, youth empowerment, and women empowerment. This is a party that believes in the youth, and this is a party that believes in women. We believe that the future is with our youth, and that is why we want to educate every child, to give every child that dream of becoming a, a, an important person in this society and to contribute to our social economic development. I strongly believe that with a visionary leader like Nana Adudankwa Ekufuadu, Kukudu, Kukudu, with a God-sent Messiah like Nana Adudankwa Ekufuadu, we are continuing to transform Ghana and we will put Ghana on a different level and it will come with the battle ahead of us. And we strongly believe and we still believe that the battle is the Lord's. So, as a new era for this constituency. I know other constituencies will follow suit. Let's be dynamic. This election rests on dynamism and vision. We cannot leave the manifesto to hang the way it's hanging. Every constituency needs to localize that manifesto that was launched by the president and take it down to our local people. Let it be relevant and important and realistic to them. And that is what will give us the votes. Our strength is the Lord. And as Psalm 27 says, the Lord is my strength and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold. And who shall I be afraid of? God will give us victory 2020. And I believe that Honorable Sarah Joseph will deliver to the people of Domingo Abenya. Thank you and God bless Dome Kwabenya. God bless our homeland guys. We are 70 days shy of the elections, just under three months to go where we will wait, sometimes impatiently, in queues to decide who is deserving of leading us for the next four years. But of course, to qualify to vote, your name must be included in the electoral roll which is why the exhibition of the register after it is compiled is crucial. It is not a mere exercise of formality. It is the next step to ensure that you are indeed eligible to vote. So since 1992, that as many as 21,000 names, including his own, could not be found in the register in the ongoing exhibition exercise. You see, the, the disparity here, or the dishonesty that I may say about the Electoral Commission is that you claim I was lying and that uh, 21,000 people could not be missing on the register. But in your statement, you said there could be, I mean, incomplete transfer of data. Incomplete transfer of data, you, you are implicating yourself. Well, the Electoral Commission's immediate response was that the MP's claim was false. In the allegation by the Ashiaman MP, to so the effect that his name has been deleted from the voters register, let me state emphatically that it is false. The name, his name has not been deleted 
nor expunged from the voters register secondly has been alleged that the names of 21,000 registered voters have been deleted from the voters register that again is false and we have evidence to that effect well, Joy News' checks on the ground confirmed Mr. Nogwe's claim. Watch. They came here, people started coming, and then their names were not in the register. So we were told to be capturing their names on this paper over here. You write their name, their uh, ID number, and then their telephone number. So when the MP also came, truly the name was not on the register. The, the first one given to us, so his name was, was also captured the ID number and, and, and the telephone number. So you can see a whole lot of names that we've written over here whose names are not on the register. That's the one that we started with on Friday. Mm. Yes. So about how many people uh, have you we are captured able to write so far about, that their names are not on the register? We were able to write about 135 before the evening. And then the, that same evening, when I got to the office, I saw that they brought a new register. Mm. So we checked on the office and I saw his name in the register. Well, the NEC claims its checks from the register in Binduri in the Upper East region, Ketu South in the Volta region, and Asawasi in the Ashanti region all show a huge number of names missing from the electoral roll. Now, whether it is by design or by mistake, it is a worrying trend, considering that other areas, particularly NPP strongholds, are not experiencing the same problem. Already, the NDC is considering not accepting the outcome of the December polls if these anomalies are not rectified. Now, another worrying aspect of this issue is the duplication of voter identification numbers. Mr. Mahama's running mate, Professor Nana Jane Opokwajiman, fell victim to this when she checked her details during the exhibition exercise. Eventually, a new card had to be printed for her to resolve the anomaly. Well, the EC believes the opposition is blowing hot air and exaggerating the situation and has described the phenomenon as normal. The normal challenges with registration. The ID card is important. It it facilitates the registration, but you can vote without the ID card. If there's something, certain thing that you don't understand, you can also call. Of course, after we meet. Yeah, but so as well as I want to say that the challenges are there. We appreciate them, but they are part of the exhibition. That's why we do exhibition and we rectify all the uh, errors and those things. That by the time we finish the panel, we'll have a credible one. But is it really normal? Should we continue to accept such repetitive challenges that, to some extent, mask the electoral process and engenders mistrust of the election management body? Consider this. In 2016, the Electoral Commission, after compiling a voter roll of 16.5 million people, allocated 21 days, 21 days for the register exhibition. In 2020, with over 80 million people on the roll, the Commission has decided to allocate eight days Clearly, this is not enough time for any discrepancies to be fixed before election day. Have we considered the thousands of people who may be unable to afford the time to check their names within this short window? People who may be inconvenienced, they may not be able to exercise this civic duty for valid reasons. Well, the EC has this answer. See, if for some reason your fingers are not able to be verified, then they try your face, then you proceed. So clearly, we are not going to use voter ID numbers on the day of voting. It's the verification which will verify your fingers will be checked. If possible, it goes to your face for us to establish that you are the one you claim you are. For, for many people, the most important thing you've clarified is that if I'm unable to follow up and resolve this problem, I can still vote yes, on December 7th. Yes, yes. To be fair, we are not in normal times. COVID-19 has thrown many plans off and delayed the activities on the electoral calendar. But the question many people are asking is for how long will the Electoral Commission allow such repetitive challenges saddle its work? Should the electorate continue to accept this systemic challenge that bedevils its work every election year? What is the point of investing millions of dollars into infrastructure that is expected to enhance the process only for us to experience the same challenges. Clearly, the EC ought to do better.
Now to the rest of our stories. Chief Executive Officer of Jandal Limited, Afi Amaro, is promising more side attractions as an outfit GS app to decorate some principal streets and key landmarks with lights ahead of the Christmas celebrations. Speaking at a ceremony to launch the event, the stated decorations, uh, she says, will start in November. Madame Afi Amaro vowed uh, Ghanaians, wow Ghanaians in December 20. 20, she says uh, she'll repeat what she did in 2019 with her hashtag Light Up Accra event, which turned the capital into a city of lights. This year, there is going to be a place where we call the Christmas Village. And that is where a lot of the pomp and pageantry, there will be monumental decorations there. There will be fun. COVID, we are going to observe all the protocols of of um, uh, co uh, uh, COVID protocols are all going to be observed. And this Christmas village is going to take the place of that liberation place where we will see more people relax there and these, this place will just be for sightseeing. So that place will be more controlled. So, I mean, it's all in the works. Uh, we are still designing, we are still uh, formulating our ideas and we think that with God on our side and because it is a good thing, it will come to pass. We are envisaging to, to do it in November, so really, to do it earlier because all over the world we realize that Christmas actually starts much earlier than what uh, happens here. And I believe that that sense also, you know, it also kicks people to be more, to think more about other people. What are they going to give to people? My mother, my sister, our workers and all that. It sets people thinking early. And so people now have become more giving. Accra Mayor Mohamed Ajaysoa says the decorations by Jandel will incorporate some of Ghana's cultural symbols. Conceived somewhere in 2018, where we thought of lighting up of Accra, and we wrote letters to all high rides um, um, properties owners within the city to to voluntarily light up their properties. And as you see in many countries as it done, um, the reception was not uh, encouraging. So in 2018, we had an engagement with Jandal, which is a company that does events and that something like that. We were quite excited with what they came up with. So together, we started to fundraise to support this whole idea. They had to import some of these things. And what was spectacular about what we did was that it was culturally in tune with what we are doing. So you had a canoe, you had an abandoned um, truck, you had abandoned ties, so we're doing recycling as well to, to use as materials for the, for the, for the light-up Accra. It was big, but this year it, we plan for it to be bigger and better. In that sense that we are adding a Christmas village. A Christmas village is going to be located at the uh, Nationalism Park, which is uh, in between the Freedom and Justice Arch and then that of the Accra Sports Stadium. That is going to be there. And that is where we want kids to come and spend some time over there. And now from elections to policy and from education to health, the multimedia group's influence has been felt everywhere in Ghana. The company has over the years dedicated a lot of airtime to stories that bring change to the lives of ordinary people and the community. Today it unveils an official cloth as part of the celebration of 25 years of impactful journalism. My colleague Fifi Kumsen has highlights of a documentary detailing this impact. The multimedia group has over the years established itself as a fiercely independent voice, speaking truth to power, reporting and exposing corruption in public institutions. It's not about us, it is about the people. That's not all. Our audience and communities are our anchor and the reason we operate. A lot of airtime on the various platforms of the group are dedicated to human interest stories. Stories that bring change in the lives of ordinary people. Nice food to eat. 
She'll be very happy. The company has done stories with far-reaching impact on the people. To be locked away, it is a difficult thing, but the worst thing of all is to be locked away and to be forgotten. Prison reforms as a result of a series of documentaries by Joy News, Locked and Forgotten and Left to Rot. The message I bring you today is that you are not forgotten and I've seen with my own two eyes what I have heard many a time about the conditions in our prisons. A new mother and baby unit for the Konfuanochi Teaching Hospital following a Joy News documentary, Next to Die, which highlighted the death of babies at the hospital. A 500,000 Ghana City school block for a community built by telecoms giant MTN after a Joy News agenda story on the community. It's 20 minutes after 9 on the Super Morning Show. Enjoy 99.7 FM in Accra and on our affiliates across the country. Later this morning, I will take you to a little village known as Esuboy. An entire village battling river blindness saved after a Joy News story. Uh, it's in the Ashanti region. It's near a forest known as Hapofu. And my brother, Ohim Interior, uh, tells me, as I spoke to him last night, he told me a very sad story. Uh, a story of uh, people living in a community where there's no portable drinking water. The village has also been overtaken by black flies. I'll take you to a... Many boreholes built by our partners across the country following stories highlighted by the Joy New Safe Water Project. when you take the brand joy it's been interpreted as Jesus first others second and yourself third yes um, we, we don't we don't do what we do for ourselves we serve the community and we also live in the community so the community's interests at all times is what we seek to um, push and, and, and advance that was an extract from the documentary Multimedia, the Impact Story, set for broadcast tomorrow at 2 p.m. on the Journeys channel. Meanwhile, some of your favorite people who have been here for decades have been sharing their experiences at the Multimedia Group. My colleague Manuel Kranting has been interacting with some of the big names behind the big stories we tell. You know, we just took some pictures, anniversary pictures, and I'm excited. Excited. Yeah. People asking, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you cook the news? How do you, how do you do all the things that people hear on radio and see on TV? You hunt. Uh. You'd want to call a hunt. Because you can't just come here and sit around. So, you know, we gather news. And in gathering news, we step out. In gathering news, we research. And you can only do this if you have passion, you know. And so, yes, the excitement you see here, we are part of something great. We are part of the Multimedia Group 25. Today, 25th, we are outdooring, you know, our anniversary cloth and all. And it's, and it's all excitement. We see a, a blood beaming with smiles like that and it's really exciting. But let me get a bit closer to Mama V. Yesterday was her birthday and oh, can we say a belated happy birthday happy to Mama V. Happy birthday to Oh, happy birthday to Multimedia. <laughs> oh, but thank you. It's just fun coming on the AM show. Waking up at dawn is crazy, uh, but I never say I won't go to work. I'm always happy to go to work. So it's just, I guess it's just the people. Just the people. Yeah. Did, did you ever see yourself, you know, doing this as a young kid or young adult? Did you think that you're going to be on TV every morning? I think so. No. I once used to collect newspapers. <laughs> I'll pretend I'm reading the news on television. So even though I didn't necessarily think at the time that I was going to be on TV, I did practice how to read the news. Let me get yeah. a bit closer to Mapito Sibiri. She's an international woman in this house. Hi, international woman. Hi, Manuel. Back, and you're fortunate to meet us. <laughs> Thanks to Nanadu. Uh, you are fortunate to meet me. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, how's it feel? I mean, you're back to Ghana and back to the multimedia group. How's it feeling? It feels good. Uh, I mean, you know, multimedia is like a home away from home for me. It has become a home away from home. I've met some really cool people. Uh, I've made friends. I've made family. You know, 
they are pastors, they are slayers. We are all in this together. Which one are you, pastor or slayer? Oh, but can you not see that Ami, <laughs> Mami Osofu? Oh, Osofu Mami. Oh, oh, oh. Adeng. Oh, she said she's Mami. O Osofu Mami. <laughs> Osofu, Osofu Mami. Mm, I love to be detailed in whatever I do. And when you are in multimedia, that's one trait you should definitely have. And so I'm happy that I always bring up to the minutes the latest happenings around Ghana and the world on the headline news and I'm so happy to be having Manuel on my side now. <laughs> well she said I'm on her side, I'm leaving. I'm absolutely a happy day for all of us. My mother is back into the camera, she wants, she's, she's been protesting. <laughs> you, you also want to finish it quick, quick, quickly. So it's been amazing, um, I've been here for a while and I'm so happy. How long do that you? I have been here for. Ten years. Hooray! Oh so a decade ago, I came here, and I'm glad that I'm part of this brand. It's been amazing. We have made some impactful stories. One of them, there was a gentleman on the street at Kaukudi. We picked him. We just did a documentary on him, and today he's in tertiary school because of the platform multimedia. He's Richard. Shout out to Richard. Isn't that amazing? Amazing. amazing. Congratulate me, congratulations to the multimedia group with 25 years and it feels great. So take a break, we'll bring you more in this. Hello there and we're back with business. Now, most rural farmers have not been able to access the government's COVID-19 stimulus package. That is according to the Peasant Farmers Association of Ghana. Well, earlier this year, President Akufuado announced a 1 billion city stimulus package to households and businesses, particularly small and medium scale enterprises under the coronavirus alleviation program. But speaking to Joy Business on the sidelines of the Ghana Federation of Forest and Farm Producers National Dialogue Series, head of programs for the Peasant Farmers Association, Charles Nyaba says, most of these farmers don't have the necessary details to claim the stimulus package. One of the major challenges that we are facing, and we think that with this platform, it will make it easier for anybody to want to actually reach to the grassroots, to the farmers, to be able to connect to that. You know, if you look at the stimulate package, it's good because the COVID-19 has actually affected the majority of farmers. But at the end of the day, they are not getting. The mere fact that you need to have your businesses registered, you need to have a TIN number, you need to have proper records before you are benefited from that facility, has already cut the farmers out because they don't meet those criteria. So the support rather goes to traders, and some of these traders usually do not target the farmers. They rather go to places like Burkina Faso, so Togo, and brought products. For instance, Ghana depends heavily on Burkina Faso food. Well, the women's wing of the Ghana Institution of Savers is advocating for more women to join the engineering and build environment profession. President of the group, Christiana Bobobi, warned girl-child stereotypes about such professions removed and girls empowered for higher education. She said this when the institution celebrated the vice president of KNUSD for being the first woman to hold the position of the school. Prince Apia has more in this report. Despite encouragement by many professionals for women to break the bounds and venture into areas described as only for men, there are still limitations in certain spheres of the economy. One of such is engineering, science and technology, which many women shy away from pursuing. It is for this reason that the Ghana Institution of Surveyors are celebrating the new Vice Chancellor of the Kwame Kuma University of Science and Technology, Professor Akosia Dixon, who is part of the group. The female branch of the Ghana Institution of Surveyors write your name in solid sterling silver. President of the group, Christiana Bobobi, who doubles as the administrator of the school lands, won't scale child stereotypes about such professions removed and girls empowered for higher education. We used to have almost no female in the land surveying, but now we can count quite a number of them. And the vice chancellor herself being an alumna of the institution and also the first female, we are so proudly associating with her for what she has achieved. The girl child should be encouraged and educated to the highest ability that she can reach. 
parents are encouraged to encourage their child, their female children also uh, take up challenges. The stereotypes must be reduced and limited so every child is given an opportunity and to take the full potential of their abilities. She spoke to Law Business when the group presented a plaque to celebrate the new Vice Chancellor of KNUST. The Vice Chancellor, Professor Akusia Dixon, who is a member of the group, says more women must be encouraged into management positions. Um, we are the managers um, of the homes, so right from um, infancy, we are taught how to do these things. So we don't even have to go to business school before we start the lessons of managing any facility. We are taught right from the beginning, and that is a plus for us. We have every cause to continue to um, give of our best in moving the wheels of this country forward in whichever profession that we find ourselves in. And I believe in us, and I believe in our capabilities. Unless we say we won't do it. But of us standing here, we Prince have Apia, reporting. Just keep now, in spite of the numerous challenges that COVID-19 has brought to bear on nations and individuals alike, resulting in some losing their jobs and others even having to start all over again, two young people, for them, it has served as an avenue to live up to the dream of becoming entrepreneurs. Now, 23-year-old Wisdom Nano and 20-year-old Sabana Asante have been sharing the inspirations behind their startup businesses. Join us as Annabella Ohenijan has more in this report. The Minister of Health has confirmed two cases of COVID-19. In the darkness and the sense of gloom that's enveloped the world through the coronavirus pandemic, two young Ghanaians have found some light, creating for themselves livelihoods. Twenty-three-year-old Wisdom Nano, 2020 graduate of the University of Ghana, started a delivery service business in 2019 as a way of solving a problem on campus. But the spread of the virus and the lockdown made him more creative about the opportunities and realities around his delivery service. Well, I started we go um, with my partner called uh, Wilfred so when we back, back on campus I realized a lot of students were facing challenges on how to get um, items and then most, uh, mostly food from within campus to their hostels and outside campus so through my personal observations I realized that um, there was not a proper I mean, delivery system within the campus community that connects students to most of the vendors on campus and outside so I engaged a few friends about it and then um, finally met my current uh, co-founder and we had uh, a lot of talks around it and we felt it was a good venture to um, explore. Then there's Sabina Santi, a 20-year-old student of the Ghana Institute of Journalism. She used the boredom from the lockdown to tap into the inner resources of her skills. This skill has become a small business. Now, through the power of social media, Sabina sells to clients all over the country every day. When the president gave the announcement that we should stay in the house because of the coronavirus, I, I was just in the house, like watching TV, eating and becoming fat. <laughs> so um, I just felt like I should do something. And I kept asking myself what I should do. And then the idea just came because before I used to sell hair bundles, just the hair bundles to people. And I was like, if you can sell hair bundles to people, why don't you make the work caps yourself so you can earn extra money for that? And um, I felt it was a good idea. So I just made some calls to some hairstylists I know, and they agreed to teach me. There's been job losses and many people in the world despondent. These two, however, are different. COVID, COVID in, in its sense, I think, uh, I mean, collapsed a lot of businesses. So we can't, I mean, make merry around that, right? So, I mean, things happen and then humanity have to rise up to make changes, right? Rise up to the occasion and uh, 
create other opportunities for themselves. So we are quite fortunate that our business was in line with COVID-19. So that's a good gain for us. The whole COVID thing, we all know it's not a good thing. It's not a good disease or sickness. But because of COVID, we got to stay at home and I got to learn a trade, something that nobody can take from me. I make a lot of money from it because I, I charge 50 cities for making a closure wake up and 100 cities for making a frontal wake up. So if I'm to get like about 10 customers, even within the week, that's a lot of money. So they say when life throws lemons at you, you make lemonade out of them. Indeed, these two youngsters have used these hard times to the advantage when many couldn't. Annabella Hennigan's report for Joy News. I believe that's a motivational piece there for young entrepreneurs out there looking for help amid COVID-19. You could do this by yourself. That's how we end business on this particular bulletin. Sport is up next with Gary L. Smith. Do stay. Welcome back to the sports on Prime. Gary L. Smith here. We begin with the story that the president of the Ghana FA, Kedu Kraku, has tasked clubs to hold on to the sanctity of the league. Now, the leader of the association says clubs are only in business if there is a product to sell. I'm happy that we've started this process of bringing back the love and to ignite passion and to create wealth for all of us. And I'm glad that I think almost all the clubs are here. This is positive. This tells all of us that we are yearning for the sport or for our game to come back. And we believe that with your support, we will have the best ever football season. If we say to ourselves that this season will be the best, believe me, it will be the best. If we say that we are going to contribute towards the repositioning agenda, if we say that we will contribute towards preaching the gospel, that yes, you are born, a bit me aye, be a issue with team in Osono. It is possible. So please, my asking and my plea is that let's believe in ourselves. Let's believe that we can create products that will be interesting and that people can be happy to be associated with. And once we have that belief, we will collectively and as individuals work towards it. I think together we have preached, we have, we have begged in court, and we have ensured that our president is of restrictions on our game. That is the first step. The second step is to ensure that we deliver an amazing football season. A season devoid of insults. A season devoid of unholy acrimonies. A season that will ensure that the entire world sees Ghana as a pace setter on the African continent. It is possible. Right. And it will take all of us working within our individual clubs and working with our clubs to ensure that we deliver quality. Just to quote the words of our sports minister during the last Congress, we are prepared to pay the price for the and earlier today, the GFA announced that a scheduled friendly against Equatorial Guinea has been cancelled because a Central African country announced new restrictions on travels due to rising COVID-19 cases there. What this means is that the FA must find a replacement or the Black Stars will only play Mali next month. Akono is unperturbed about the changes as he believes friendly matches are directed towards the main objective, which is to win the AFCON. Upcoming friendly matches are expected to give CK Akono an idea about the quality of his setup ahead of the qualifiers for the 2022 African Cup of Nations. CK, who was appointed in February this year, has not had the opportunity of playing any match due to the coronavirus pandemic. The former Black Stars captain says matches of this nature are meant to build his team towards the main objective. This is a friendly match. Uh, and it is important for me to look in deep into it and see who and who can, can help the team and make the team better. Uh, we want to be a team that uh, will attack and play 
a constructive football, an easy going football, but a, with discipline, a lot of discipline. Now I want to try as much as I can to bring uh, our style of play. I think I've been around for a while and everybody knows how I go about my team and how they play and, and that is the Ghanaian way of, of, of playing and so I want to do my best in that area. I'm not perfect, I, I will need advice, I will need help, support, anybody and I think uh, once we do that, this is ours, let's do it right without any uh, misunderstanding. We will disagree, we will agree, but the bottom line is, is to, to hit the target and the target is for us to win the AFCON. Ghana and Mali have played each other a couple of times at the continent's major football competition. CK is confident the game is a very good test for his team as they seek to qualify for the next AFCON. Mali is a very strong side. We've seen them uh, a couple of matches that they've played in the AFCON. A very strong force. Uh, so it is, it is a very good test for us. Um, we want to go there and, and try as much as we can to, to do our best give our best and of course uh, to, to, to win that match. Yeah. And what I have, I have done is, is to communicate positively with them the way forward, what ought to be done, what cannot be accepted uh, in the team and, and all that. And, and so I think the message is clear. Uh, they are aware of what, what to, to do when it's time. And, and so I'm looking forward to a very good response, uh, a team that is disciplined, you know, apart from the fact that we go on the field and play, uh, behavior outside the field of play is also key uh, for us. And these are things I've, I've done and of course I've learned myself uh, about the game uh, in terms of how to approach it, how to uh, give the boys chance, make them comfortable when they come around to play and all that. And so uh, I'm positively uh, engaged in, in all these areas and uh, I believe that uh, what is ahead of us it is difficult, but it, it, can, it can be done in a very, in a very uh, positive way. Ghana is currently leaders of Group F with six points, having beaten South Africa and Sao Tome and Principe in November 2019. Don't forget that you can get more from the Joy Sports team this weekend. Tomorrow morning from 7 a.m., George Adel Jr. will be here on Sports Review with his regular guest um, Ayala Papapoku and the rest of the gang they'll be talking about the black stars call up and other issues and then on radio at 12 15 nathaniel Atto will be there with the joy sports link in the evening hans will be here no tomorrow i'll be here at 7 30 for scoreboard showing you all the highlights and then on sunday as well join me on radio at 4 p.m for the manchester city versus leicester city premier league game live on joy fm i'm gary al smith and that's the sport for now Wrap up the bulletin tonight. Uh, for more news, log on to myjohnline.com for all the updates. Tonight, we're not going to be airing PM personality profile because there's been some development with the secession in Western Togoland. And so we're going to be having PM special edition at 9 p.m. Stay tuned on the Joy News channel and enjoy the rest of our programs.